Uh, okay, so um, so welcome to this uh, to this parallel session about the the interplay between dynamical systems and functional analysis. So we're going to have uh, uh, in order of presentation first uh, Maria Joana Torres, Pablo Guarino, Alexandre Baraviera, and the main speaker Stanislav Henkel. So uh, I'd like to thank you. All to thank everyone for accepting the invitation and thanking uh, SPM for organizing the, this conference. So, first of all, uh, Joana Torres, with the, uh, gonna talk about the closing lemma in the Planner General Density Theorem for Sobolev maps. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank David for the invitation to speak in this session. And I also would like to congratulate him for this idea of uh, organizing a session with this subject, this interplay between dynamical systems and uh, functional analysis. Well, the, the work that, that I will present in this talk is a joint work with uh, Assis Azevedo, David Azevedo and Mario Bessa. And it is really an interplay between dynamical systems and analysis because David, Mario, and myself, we work in dynamical systems, and Assis Azevedo works in analysis, and especially in Sobolev spaces. So as we used to say, he's our analyst. And so I also would like to say that it has been a great pleasure to, to be part of this team. And um, Então, first, as a, a kind of motivation, for the class of systems that we have been working. Uh, I would like to say that this class of Sobolev of Neomorphism has been in recent times uh, very active in appears in applications to certain types of partial differential equations in nonlinear elasticity. It appears also in global analysis subjects related with the regularity problem that is the problem of approximating mappings by others with stronger regularity. In particular, it was, in particular, it was uh, solved the planar approxim Sobolev approximation problem for by uh, Ivaniek, Kovalek, and Oninen for the case of P strictly between one and infinity, and the important case P equal to one was solved by Hunkel and Pratelli. And I think that you will have the pleasure to hear about this in the last uh, talk of this session. It also appears in works uh, of Edson Faria and Peter Hazard, where they prove that certain generalizations of the CR Whitney topology, like the Holder or the Sobolev topology, are bare. And also recently, in collaboration with Asish, David, and Mari, we have proved a version of a losing theorem for the Sobolev class, proving that uh, every uh, uh, almost preserving measurable map is nearly a Sobolev homeomorphism. It also appears in subjects related with ergodic theory. In this year, Edson Faria, Hazard, and Tresser proved for this class that uh, generically the topological entropy is infinite. And in dynamical systems, which is in fact the subject of this talk, where we proved recently the closing lemma, the general density theorem, that it is the abstract of, of this talk. But in the end, I will also say something about the Oxtobulum theorem, because two weeks ago we submitted a paper where we proved the Oxtobulum theorem for this class. And so, I will begin first with the closing lemma and general density theorem. And the last part of the talk, I will say some words about the Oxtobulum theorem in this class. But just uh, looking to this slide, you can see that uh, almost all works are very recently. And well, I, I hope that it, this motivates uh, more people to, to look for this class and to try to, to prove dynamical results in this class and also improve the analysis that is needed to, to obtain dynamical results. And so first, beginning with the closing lemma, 
An important problem, which goes back to Poincaré, is the well-known closing lemma, and the question is the following. If an orbit comes back very close to itself, is it possible to close it by a small perturbation of the system? Poincaré believed that such a closing could be performed in very general situations, but indeed there are known answers only for coarse topology like C0, C1, or as I will talk in this talk, uh, for the Sobolev topology. Probably the most important result uh, which comes out from the closing lemma is the general density theorem, who, sta who states that from the generic viewpoint, the closure of the set of periodic orbits is the set where the dynamics is truly relevant. This set, in the non-conservative case, is no wandering set. I will recall that a point is no wandering if there exists a nearby point who returns arbitrarily close, or is the old manifold in the conservative case. Comparing the closing lemma in different topologies with the persistence of periodic orbits, because indeed, besides the use of the closing lemma, the main ingredient to obtain general density theorem is the persistence of periodic orbits, we have that the proof in the C0 case is easy, apart perhaps from the case for the geodesic flow, but the proof in C1 topology is much harder and indeed, it is much harder because of problems related with the size of the support of the perturbation that is needed to perform a small C1 perturbation. For R bigger, bigger, bigger than 1 is still a hard open problem. Surprisingly, when we think of persistence of periodic orbits, the, this, this issue is simpler in the differentiable case because in this case, uh, uh, the persistence of periodic orbits can be expressed through hyperbolicity, which persists, but in the topological case, it's much more harder. With respect to the Sobolev closing lemma, I will in a while to state the precise formulation. Given an, an unwandering point, we can close its trajectory by making an arbitrary small perturbation. I would like to refer, you can see that both results are of the same year, that Edson Faria, Assard, and Tresser preserved a proof for the non-conservative setting, and we have presented a simpler proof that also works in the conservative case. With respect to the planar general density theorem, and perhaps the first interesting question is why here we only have this result for the planar uh, setting. Well, generically, the closed trajectories are dense in the no-wandering set. And the main ingredient, and indeed the main difficulty, is to deal with the permanence of periodic orbits. And to deal with this, what we make is a double argument in which, in one side, we use the Brouwer index, which is robust under C0 perturbations, and in the other side, we use hyperbolicity. But clearly, to use hyperbolicity, we need to demand for differentiability, at least for a map arbitrarily close from the Sobolev point of view. But this bypass so a, so a, through a differentiable map is really very hard to obtain, and indeed, regularization of Sobolev 1p homeomorphisms is known only for planar domains. Well, we will hear about this later in this session, and this is the reason why our result uh, only, we only know how to prove this result for the planar, for the planar setting. And so now I will uh, say the precise uh, spaces in which we work. Mm -hmm. So let U be an open bounded subset of Rn with Lipschitz boundary, P and Q between 1 and infinity, and let the lambda denote the Lebesgue measure. I recall that a measurable map is in the Sobolev class W and P if each component in all its distributional partial derivatives are in LP. We window with this space with the natural norm defined by the following sum. 
we shall be interested only on Sobolev maps, which are continuous up to the boundary. And that in this case, we consider the following space. And the natural norm in this space is equivalent to the norm defined by the following sum, the sum of the uniform norm plus the P norm of the derivative since C0 is included in LP. And so now, the spaces we work with, we have the space of Sobolev 1P homeomorphisms, which is the space of all homeomorphisms that belong to the previously defined space. We, we endow this space with the natural metric defined by the following sum. And we also consider its subspace of volume preserving elements. Now, given P and Q, we consider also the space of B sovolev homeomorphisms as the space of all P homeomorphisms whose inverse is a Q homeomorphism. And clearly, we window this space with the natural metric defined as follows. And we shall also consider the subspace of volume preserving elements. All these spaces are bare. And now, the Sobolev 1P closing lemma that we proved. I just recall that a point is periodic of period N if N is the shortest time that the point takes to return to itself. And a point is no wondering if there exists a nearby point who returns arbitrarily close. So a point is no wondering if given N, any neighborhood there exists a point which returns arbitrarily close. So, the precise statement of the theorem, consider X to be any of the spaces that I previously defined. Let F be any map in these spaces. And so we have the following. Giving a no wandering point, we can close its trajectory. That is, we can obtain a near, an arbitrarily close periodic point for an arbitrarily close uh, Sobolev homeomorphisms in the, in the Sobolev norm. The idea of the proof, I will say, which is the idea of the proof, of uh, our proof of the Sobolev closing lemma. And the idea is the following. Consider for A and B as follows, the following ellipsoid. We have proved an auxiliary lemma and indeed fundamental, who says the following given A and B and mu between 0 and 1, there exists a C infinite volume preserving diffeomorphism G, which is equal to the identity outside this ellipsoid and which exchanges points in the following way in the smaller ellipsoid. In addition, there exists a constant C, which is independent of A, B and mu, such that all partial derivatives of G and its inverses are bounded uh, uh, this way. So the proof is the following. We begin with an wandering point. We take epsilon positive and a fundamental lemma, which was proved by Pug, allow us to put ourselves in the setting illustrated in the following picture in the following sense. There exists a point X in the nitrate such that these points are epsilon close from the no wandering point. These points belong to the smaller ellipsoid and all the intermediate points of the orbit are outside the bigger ellipsoid. Moreover, the eccentricity of these ellipsoids is constant is to where it is independent of epsilon. So it turns out clear that if you are able to be in, in the setting of this picture, the desired perturbation H can be defined as the composition of G given by the lemma and uh, F. It is clearly that X is a periodic point of H and we are also able to prove that H is close to F in the Sobolev 1P norm. Indeed, making the volume decreasing to zero and noting that the partial derivatives are uniformly bounded independently of epsilon, we are able to control Sobolev 1P norm. Now, concerning the general density theorem, 
we have proved in the dissipative case, because indeed we only have the regularization result for the dissipative case, we have proof that there exists a residual set where the no-wandering set coincides with the closure of the periodic points. The ingredients of the proof of the general density theorem are the following. We will use the closing lemma, as I said in the beginning, that will allow us, uh, when we complete the proof, to obtain one periodic orbit. Then we have that key ingredient that I spoke about, which is periodic orbits are permanent, at least for generic Sobolev homeomorphisms. To prove this, that gener generically the periodic orbits are permanent, we use in one side the Brouwer fixed point index, because to have an, an index different from zero on a set implies the existence of a fixed point in that set. And moreover, displaying non-zero non index is stable by C0 perturbations. We combine this, the Brouwer fixed point index, with hyperbolicity, and we are able to prove that there exists a residual where the periodic points are permanent, that is, they persist under perturbations. Moreover, this residual set contains the C1 residual subset of the Kupka male diffeomorphisms, that is, the diffeomorphism where all periodic orbits are hyperbolic. The king clearly, if you, we use hyperbolicity, we need to make a regularization to be able to, to, to deal with the differentiable maps. And this really, as I explained, is only known for planar domains. Then, last, we use a semi-continuity argument for this map, the map that to which f associates the closure of periodic points. In this sense, since by the point two, two generically, the, the, the periodic points are permanent, then we can conclude that this map is lower semi-continuous. We also proved uh, a proposition that it is harder to obtain in the Sobolev topology that we are able to create periodic sinks from periodic points. Indeed, our goal is to obtain a, point which, a periodic point which is permanent. And so the proof goes as follows. Since generically the periodic points are permanent, then this map beta is lower semi-continuous on a residual set. Then it is well known that the continuity points of this map form a residual subset. So now we take a continuity point and we suppose by contradiction that we have a point with non-trivial recurrence, that is an wandering point far from periodic points. So we use the closing lemma to close its trajectory. So we have a nearby Sobolev map with a periodic point arbitrarily close. Using the last result that I talk, we are able to perform an extra perturbation so that the point becomes a periodic sink. But since WMP is a, a bare space and R is a residual set, it is dense and therefore we can have an extra perturbation in which we have an element in R with a periodic point P bar close to P. But this clearly is in contradiction with the fact that F was a continuity point of this map beta. And with like this, we prove the generally the density theorem. Well, the, the abstract of this talk indeed ended with the general density theorem, but we continue working. Uh, uh, sorry, Trina, I'm going to need to finish uh, quickly. Okay, uh, okay, okay. I'll, yes, I think two minutes and uh, I'll finish. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I think two or three minutes and I'll finish. Okay, okay, David, thank you. So, back in the, there is an important result in dynamical systems, which, which is the oxtobi ulam theorem. And back in the 19th century, in, during his studies in the dynamical theory of gases, Boltzmann formulated a principle very important in statistical physics, the ergodic hypothesis. Roughly, this principle says the following, time averages equal space averages, at least for typical points. 
This can be formalized, saying that the map which leaves a measure invariant must satisfy the following equality, at least for typical points. Another equivalent definition of ergodicity says that any F invariant set must have zero or full bag measure. It is really an important result in dynamical systems, the Oxtobulum theorem proved in the 40s, which says that ergodicity is generic among measure preserving homeomorphisms. And what we have recently proved is the Sobolev version of the Oxtobulum theorem. We made this in a particular Sobolev setting in which we have n bigger than 2 and p smaller than n minus 1. And we consider this space, the closure with respect to Sobolev 1p topology of the set of Lipschitz conservative of homomorphisms. Indeed, this is the space, the space already considered by Edson and Tresser in, this, in these works, their works about the generosity of the topological, of the infinite topological entropy. And we have proved that generically, the ergodic, the, that uh, ergodicity is generic between Sobolev homeomorphisms. Just one minute, just I would like to say that the main ingredient to prove the Oxtobulum theorem is a uh, Sobolev Ludwin theorem to be able to approximate um, a measure preserving map by a Sobolev uh, one. And indeed, we proved a Sobolev version of the theorem two years ago that we needed to improve to be able to prove the Oxtobulum theorem. Uh, well, I don't have the time to explain why we, we work in this setting. This is the, the situation in which we, we are in a winning situation to control the LP arm. And this is the reason why our class has this, this restriction. Okay. This is a very recent result, okay? I will show here some references. And well, thank you very much for all the attention, okay? Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, Pablo Wari. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't have any questions here, so I need to move on. In. So uh, next we have Pablo Wari with the uh, renormalization theory for dimensional dynamics. So David, I need to use my tablet. Uh, do, it, do I need to, to enter? Do, I think you need to do something. I can. So you're. I don't know because. I don't, your mic is not so good. I don't know if it's only me. I, I don't hear what you're saying too good. David, your, your, your sound is not good. Not at all. I'm sorry. Because I mean, you have, pro you, 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 you have to be given permission to, to uh, a speaker, right? So if you need another, if you log in another, I don't know if you, one needs to give permission again, but uh, I'm, I'm not the one who does that. Okay, let me yeah. let me see. Good. I think I'm here. So David, do you see another another Pablo Guarino? Because I think you need to give me some access to share my screen with this. I'm here. I'm inside, but I think you have to do something. You want to be to uh, in the other here, okay? I will I will pass here for advice. <clears throat> so 
So, do you know how to do this? So, in my company. So, at some point, when I enter, you change my position, you know. I think I'm on the second list, the attendees, and you need to put me as a panelist. I think this is what you need to do. I'm I'm asking for your permission. Let me see if they they uh, buy you for him. They give sorry. You. I think it's that right. I need to be as a panelist. So, David, I can't hear you when you talk, but uh, I think it was you or, or someone when I first entered, you put myself in the panelist list. I think this is what is need to be done in order to, for me to be able to share the screen. But when you talk, I'm not listening to you, David. Pablo, Pablo, you, you cannot, you, you, you can't share. If you share your screen, it doesn't work or try because you are in the panelist. So, but okay. not the tablet. This is a, what I'm saying. Okay. I'm also on the second list on the attendees. This is the tablet where I have the, I can go out from the computer too, but that's just for the screen, for the camera. If you try to... That is a uh, uh, little bit complicated. Uh, you have to be one, only one... Uh, Maybe if you enter in your tablet with the, the Zoom uh, link and we, we, we do, don't see your face, maybe. Okay. okay, well, I enter with my Zoom link, but yeah, so you are suggesting to, to enter this, the computer. Enter uh, in the, in the tablet. The order do do Alexander Baravieras talk now while try to solve the, the technical problems and then do Pablo Barino afterwards. Fine for me, no problem. Okay, it's okay for you, Alexander. Okay, for okay. there is no possible oh, okay. both uh, both uh, Paulo Guarino. Are okay, so, the okay. Okay, so we leave this one and you put me on the other side. Okay, good. I will leave this one. Technical of that you're gonna share so we're going to Alexandre Baraviera now talk about I can't hear you. I don't know if it's if it's my problem or <clears throat> I 
Do, do you hear me? Yes, now I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Can, I'm sorry. Sorry, so, so do you hear me? Is it possible to listen to me? Yes, sir, now yeah. you're fine. Okay, okay, so thank you, David, for this invitation. It's, uh, and thank the organizers for, of this meeting. It's really a pleasure to, to attend this. This, this meeting, uh, of course, it would be much better to be in Portugal, but it's impossible in this moment, but it's a great pleasure to be attending to, to, to do this, this event. So uh, the kind of thing I would like to tell you is uh, joint work with my Portuguese friends, Joana Torres, that's here, and Pedro Duarte, uh, Joana from Minho, and Pedro from Lisbon, and well, they are really much more than colleagues. They are very nice friends. So it's a pleasure to tell something we are doing with Portuguese colleagues in this, in this event. So uh, this, this thing is really uh, corresponds to something that is already published in Communications in Contemporary Mathematics. So if you wanna get more details, you can just go through the, the, the paper, but uh, the, the main idea, uh, we are, talking about graphs and stationary measures. So what is this thing about? Well, we just consider a graph. This one is very simple, uh, just with four vertices, one, two, three, and four, that are the black dots. And we also consider connections among the, the, the vertices that are the blue arrows. So for example, you can leave one and go to two, or for example, you can go from two to three or from three to two, it's following the arrows. Uh, you can, for example, stay in one. And so you leave one and goes to one. So it's also possible in this context. And we can code all this information in, for example, some matrices. In a matrix like this one, this matrix W. So W11 means the probability from leaving one and going to one. W21 means the probability from going to, from one to two and so on. So this is the code. Uh, the element wij means the probability from leaving j and going to i. Uh, of course, you cannot interpret this matrix as a probability. You can think more generally. You can think and it can allow, for example, w to be uh, w i j as complex numbers in a more general setting. But it will keep this probabilistic interpretation along all this, this, this talk. So it's better for our purposes. And that's exactly what the kind of thing we have in mind. So this is a very simple graph. Uh, you have this matrix, you can talk about the spectrum of these matrices, the eigenvalues. Uh, and we can say a lot of things, you know, uh, the, the, poly, the characteristic polynomial and so on. But you can think on more uh, uh, things about this. For example, from this probabilistic interpretation, we see that the, each column adds to one, because if you leave one, you need to arrive in some somewhere. So each column adds to one. That's important. And one is the, the number one is one of the eigenvalues of the matrix W. Is indeed the largest one. Uh, so. We can look for this uh, vector, this eigenvector W that corresponds to eigenvalue one with all the entries that are non-negative. So, and this is the stationary measure. So this is exactly this kind of thing we are looking for. So in this finite case, it's easy to, to obtain, but we would like to, to consider more general situations. For example, we would like to consider here a graph with or where the, the number of vertices is no longer uh, finite. It's countable, and then I just label them as zero, one, two, three, and so on. And you consider probabilities of transitions. So uh, if you are in the level one, for example, you can go one level up or one level down, and you can, by the blue arrows, uh, stay at the same level. So that's exactly the probabilities we have in this situation. Uh, well, uh, this is not so easy to consider because here uh, the, the matrix, uh, if you write the operator, it's an infinite, uh, the matrix is not no longer finite. So you need to consider this as an operator. So this is 
W is a linear operator uh, acting on this Banach space. But you can talk about the spectrum of this operator. Sometimes you can talk about eigenvalues. But you can still look for the eigenvector corresponding to the point one that is still in the spectrum. Okay. So uh, for this particular case, it's possible to provide some magic formulas uh, to write this, this special eigenvalue, this stationary measure. So we can get some conditions on the, the Bs, deltas, and Cs in order to get some stationary measure. So this is a situation that's more or less well understood. So we really want to consider a more general thing. Uh, so now we, we consider a kind of graph that we can divide in layers in this way. For example, we have some layer that I call gamma zero, where I have some points. Uh, I get another, I have another layer that I call gamma one, where we have another points, gamma two and so on. And it is stratified in such a way that we allow transitions among one layer that's represented by this matrix delta zero. So this is, this matrix encodes all the transitions in this layer. This matrix delta one encodes all the transitions uh, inside this, this layer gamma one and so on. I can go from one layer to the layer above. So this is B0, for example, B1 and so on. And I can go from some layer to the layer below. Okay, so this is C1, C2 and so on. So now they are matrices, they are no longer numbers. Um, I had made a special choice of one point here, but it's not, it's not important. I can make choice of finite numbers of points in each layer. Uh, it, but it's finite, but it's not necessarily bounded. And well, to deal with uh, countable number, it's still possible. It's not important to consider the situation here, but we can deal with this kind of thing also. Okay. So the idea is to consider exactly the problem of stationary measures in this setting, this more general setting. And well, now the operator W is something in this way. This is a three diagonal uh, operator. We have here the deltas, we have the Cs and the Bs. So it's still an operator acting on this Banach space and we would like to find stationary probabilities. So the theorem uh, in collaboration with Pedro Duarte and Joana Torres say that under some technical conditions, this uh, operator is, has indeed a unique stationary measure. So that's the, the, the main result we, we would like to tell you. So what about the technical conditions? Uh, well, the technical conditions, I'll just say a few words. They are that delta zero is primitive, meaning that uh, every point in the layer gamma zero is connected to every point in some sense. So this is important in order to you, you to have uh, the uniqueness of the measure. Without this condition, maybe we can have existence, but it's not necessarily unique. So this is primitive in order to assure uniqueness. Uh, the Bs, they are small. What I would like to say with this, this thing, I'm just trying to say that the elements, the entries of the matrices Bs, they are small in some sense, saying that you have not a lot, a big probability of leaving the, the, the layer gamma zero. So you would like to stay close to gamma zero in some sense. The probability of going to infinite is very, very small. It's important in, in order you get stationary measures. And the Cs, they are far from zero. So what's the meaning of this, this thing? Well, I'm just meaning that you cannot be trapped in some layer gamma two, for example, or gamma infinite you can always have, you always have the probability of going down. It's important in order you get uh, these this measures, okay? So those are more or less the technical conditions, I tested them in a very in a few words. And well, what can I say about the proof? What is the idea, the main, the main considerations about the proof? So the idea is to use uh, the so-called isospectral reduction it's a procedure, a theory developed by Bunimovich and Webb some, I don't know, 15 years ago for more or less. And it's really a very beautiful way that you can apply to matrices. 
And well, uh, the idea is to reduce the matrix, reduce the size of the matrix, but keeping as much as possible information about the spectrum. So of course, it's much easier to deal with small matrices than to deal with larger ones. But if you can conserve, preserve the information about the spectrum, then you can, well, deal with the smaller matrices, uh, find something about the spectrum, and transport this information to the original case. That's more or less what the theory of Bunimovich and Webb do. It's very, very beautiful. But in our context, the matrices are no longer finite. We are dealing with operators. So you need to consider an extension of these ideas of Bunimovich and Webb to the context of operators. So it's important to use something that was already done by Pedro Duarte and Joana Torres, that was an extension of the spectral reduction theory to the context of operators, okay? Then you need to deal with operators, no longer matrices. You deal with the spectrum and not only eigenvalues, but you can do, well, we can work with the theory in this more general context. It's very important. So we would like to apply this, this theory, these ideas, to this specific graph we are dealing with, okay? So again, that's the kind of the graph, that's the, the, the face of the, the guy. We have the this matrices, the probabilities to stay, the probabilities to go up, the probabilities to go down. And well, what's the, the main idea in this uh, Bonimovich and Webb procedure? The idea is to consider a subgraph that for us will be the guys uh, with indexes, the even index, so gamma zero, gamma two, gamma four, and so on. So in some sense, I will just forget the gamma one, gamma three, and so on. I will just erase those guys. And we can get uh, the new parameters, the new deltas, the new Bs for the new graph. So the new graph is the subgraph, gamma zero, gamma two, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in order to obtain the new delta zero, the probability to stay in the layer zero, I need to consider, well, the original probability to stay in zero, that's delta zero, the original one. But I need also to consider the guys that go to the gamma one that was deleted, that was erased. And then they go to this place with probability described by B zero. They can stay in this layer gamma one for some times. So this is described by I minus, the identity minus delta one, so minus one. And then they go back by C1 to the layer zero, okay? So this is the, the, the way we obtain the delta zero, delta zero star, that's the new parameter delta zero, the new probability to stay in the layer gamma zero. So I can do that for gamma two, gamma four, and so on. And I can do that with the parameters B0, B1, and so on. We can obtain the new parameters for this new graph, for the subgraph, okay? And we can also, so we obtain those people. So this is the description, the complete description of the behavior of this, this new graph, of this new stochastic process. Uh, and then we just relabel uh, the, 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 the layers. This is gamma two, gamma four, and so on. I can relabel, replacing two by one, replacing four by two, and so on. So in the end, I still have something with that is gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, and so on. And I have probabilities from going on one level up, one level down, and a probability to stay. Describe it again by these guys with the stars. So this is still a three diagonal operator. Uh, the sizes of those matrices can change, but well, doesn't matter too much. But this uh, new operator W star is exactly an image of the, it's obtained from the original operator W, so it's the R of W, it's the reduced loop W, okay? So this is a, a dynamical system defined on the space of operators. I send some operator W to a new operator W star. Okay, so the idea is that I start with W and I can make the reduction and then apply the reduction again and again and again. Uh, and an important thing in this theory is that if I have a fixed point, for example, the, the, the stationary probability for R of W, I can reconstruct the invariant probability for the original W, okay? 
And if I do many more steps, any steps, if I get the fixed point for this guy, I can also go back to obtain something here behind. So this is the, origin, the, the, the stationary measure for the original operator. But the point is that the, uh, the, when you apply this reduction procedure, uh, this is a very, very contrative procedure, okay? This is a very contrative dynamical system. So you're getting very close to something that I call U. It's a kind of operator that is easier to consider than the original W. So you can really find the, the uh, invariant probability for U and use this probability since Rn is very close to U, use this U as uh, an approximation of the fixed point of Rn, okay? And you go back by reconstruction, you get something that I call Un that is an approximation of the stationary invariant measure of W, okay? So of course you can do that for more N, you can go further on N, you just take a limit and you get something that is converging to the guy that I call the blue V, that is the stationary probability of W, okay? So that's the idea. So a very important thing here is that the procedure, this is a spectral reduction is a very, very fast uh, uh, dynamical system that contracts uh, a lot in each step. So that's the main point. And in this way, we get the existence of the stationary probability that we claimed, okay? So, and using, well, the, the fact that delta zero is primitive, uh, we get the, the uniqueness, okay? So that's the proof in five minutes. Well, and just to, to finish, I would like to tell you some, some questions we are trying to, to consider now. Uh, for example, uh, consider the same setting, the layered graph, gamma zero, gamma one, uh, this is one, two, and so on, sorry. But we would like to consider the possibility of going from the, the first level, level zero, to all the other levels. This is more or less similar to what appears in probability theory as the renewal process. So you can go from the, this basic level to all the others, and we would like to find stationary measures in these cases again. So we think that we can apply the same kind of philosophy in order to deal with this case. This is something we are trying to do, okay? That's a question, but we think we can deal with. And the other question, we can think in a more abstract way. Uh, you just start with some stochastic matrix A, you, it has a spectrum like this, and we would like to apply the, res, the reduction operator to get another matrix A with the spectrum that is contained with this, this blue inside part. This, this, well, of course we have one as an eigenvalue, but apart from one, we would like to have something that is strictly included inside the spectrum of the other. So if it happens, you have a lot of gain when you use the reduced matrix because it's more contractive in these components, okay? So it's really interesting to, to, to deal with this kind of matrix. We would like to know uh, if you can find conditions on the, the stochastic matrix or maybe stochastic operators that assure this kind of behavior. So we'd like to find this kind of thing under some conditions. It's not clear exactly what to, to use, but that's the kind of thing we are investigating now. Uh, this is something we are trying to do with Joana, Pedro, and also with a Chinese mathematician, Long Mei Shu. He's with us in this, in this path. So I think it's what I would like to tell you. It's a pleasure to, to, to attend. And thank you a lot for the patience. And I can say this in Portuguese, muito obrigado. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Questions here, but uh, I mean, I don't think we have time. I'm sorry because so technical problems. We're uh, we're
So let me share my screen, David. I hope now it's going okay. I didn't, I wasn't able to hear you again, just to say, I don't know if it's only me or everybody's listening to you. Is this okay? Are you listening to me? No, nobody. Uh, I can hear you. I can, I can nope. hear you, but the, the screen is, I mean, I see the screen, but I don't see anything don't interesting. See the, the, the talk. There I am. Now it's okay? Okay, yes. Yes. Good, good. Good, good. Well, thank you, thank you. Sorry for the problems. And uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for, for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, as Alexandre was saying, it would be much better to be in Portugal. I've never been in Portugal, so hopefully next time we are all together physically. But anyway, thanks again for the invitation. It's quite an honor to be here. And uh, let me say, so I, I was looking a little bit about uh, what people will be talking about. And I think what I, what I do is not so close to, you know, to this uh, dynamics of sovereign level spaces and all the things that you are more inside. So uh, my plan is to give a, only a brief uh, survey, a brief uh, overview of uh, renormalization theory, which is what, what I like to study most. And uh, so I will give just, you know, an overview without not getting into details, also because of the, of, you know, 15 minutes, I wouldn't be able to give so many details, but anyway, just as, a, as an invitation, uh, somehow, and then maybe we can talk later about more specific details. So, uh, as I said, as I put on the abstract, I will talk about uh, renormalization, renormalization theory. So I, I wrote here a definition, renormalization uh, of a dynamical system means what? Means, I will try to see, to put this here, means a, a rescale first return map. So let me put this here. So you take a, usually you have a mark point. Uh, usually, at least for us today, will be a critical point. So you have a dynamical system with critical points. It is not a global diffio, you have critical points. And then you want to study return maps around this critical point, uh, whether if they exist, of course, some dynamical system will be renormalized and some will not. And if you have a return map, then you, this new dynamical system, which is uh, the whole travel until you come back, will be your renormalization. This is a general definition. After some rescaling, so usually, you know, you have a small neighborhood coming back and then you want to recover some size, some mass. So the renormalization of a dynamical system will be the return map restricted to a suitable domain that comes back and up to some rescaling. There is a picture here that you can see. And then of course the rescale uh, depends uh, on where you are. This theory is, is much more developed in one dimensional dynamics because in one dimensional dynamics it's kind of obvious. Uh, you use uh, linear rescaling, you just multiply by some number to recover the space. Uh, to recover your size uh, in dimension two yet you can do if you have topological disk as domain for your return map you can use some ribbon mapping theorem as a canonical way to rescale but then in higher dimension it becomes more and more difficult and this is one of the reasons why renormalization theories is much more developed in one dimensional dynamics okay so in dimension one the rescale is just an affine rescale or a linear rescale so let me try to be more clear. Uh, the, the standard example is unimodal maps, uh, at least the first uh, important example that appear. So you can see there the graph of a unimodal map and, uh, and, and you have some omega, omega denoting the, the domain that returns to itself. And you can see that in two iterates, this returns, uh, this interval returns to itself. So in this case, you can see here, let me try to draw something good. The two iterates here, you come back, and this is the graph of F square. So you have a return map to a neighborhood around the critical point. And then what you do is the rescaling of this return map. There is also a flipping here just to recover the, the position, right? And then the, the important here is that this return map is of the same class as the original map. They belong to the same space. These are called unimodal because you have one uh, branch point, one critical point. And then the return map to this little domain after your rescaling is again a unimodal map. Then uh, what you can call, 
try to do is see if, if you are renormalizable again. I mean, for this return map after the rescaling, you may have an interval coming back to itself around the critical point, the same process as before. And then you will say that your map is again renormalizable and maybe you can do the same. You can iterate this process infinitely many times. So in principle, you can consider the space, as you can see here, of infinitely renormalizable maps, right? All unimodal maps that are renormalizable infinitely many times. And then in this space, you have an operator uh, that is this operator, the renormalization operator. So the idea is that you start with this uh, one dimensional dynamics, you are studying uh, interval dynamics, and then you ended up acting with an operator on an infinite dimensional phase space. So now your phase space uh, is an infinite dimensional and quite wild uh, phase space, uh, topologically, which is the space of infinitely normalizable maps. Well, in principle, you may wonder, maybe there are no infinitely normalizable maps, so I can do much more detail here, but yes, this is infinite dimensional. In fact, uh, you can think of a lamination inside the whole space of unimodal maps and your leaves, you have infinitely many leaves and the leaves are co-dimension one. So they, they, they have no interior, they are co-dimension one, but they are huge. So you have a well-defined dynamical system on an infinite dimensional phase space, okay? And this is a renormalization operator acting on unimodal maps. Uh, depending on which setting you are, either real dynamics or complex dynamics, uh, different renormalization operators exist and are studied, but always with this spirit that I was mentioning at the beginning of having a first return map to a neighborhood of a critical point or a, a special mark point, okay? So this is the general idea. And in particular, you have a sequence, this sequence QN that you can see here, which is a sequence of periods. So for each return that you have at level N, you have uh, a period, which is how many iterates you need to wait until uh, neighborhood comes back. So the sequence QN is the sequence of periods. And in fact, uh, I can say, I was saying that this is a huge space. So for instance, you can prove that given any sequence QN, any sequence of periods, uh, you always have a huge space of guys which are infinitely renormalizable and with this uh, prescribed uh, data, okay? So at least if, uh, and right now I'm not saying why, I, I will try to, to give some motivation for study this, but at least it makes sense to consider this space and this operator. And uh, well, I hope this fits uh, reasonably, even that there are no sovereign spaces uh, or dynamics here, it fits inside the spirit of this uh, session, uh, which was about the interaction of, or the interplay between dynamics and functional analysis. So here you have uh, your functional spaces and, and we will see, I will just make a few comments, but we will see that uh, uh, why this becomes, uh, it, this creates uh, several difficulties, of course, uh, which you don't have when you study dynamics on finite dimensional phase space. So whatever, so there is this, just to make some application, let me go to a classical example that I guess everybody knows, but whatever, which is the quadratic family. So you have the unit interval uh, being mapped to itself by this famous formula, lambda x, one minus x, the parameter lambda is a real parameter on zero four. And what happens is, is this, this picture that you can see here. So you start with very small parabolas for lambda close to zero, and then you go up, you go up, and for lambda equal four, you are touching the, the image of the critical point is, is one. After four, you are leaving the unity interval, okay? So you have a one parameter family of uh, folding maps of, of the unit interval. And, uh, and okay, so this is well known. Let me try to remind some stuff, but there is, if you think of the parameter space, uh, there is this uh, famous uh, diagram, and I'll just make a rough picture here, but there is a parameter, this guy, lambda infinity, which in, in fact is infinitely normalizable, an infinitely renormalizable guy, and the periods here are always two. So this guy, lambda infinite, is some parameter, and it doesn't matter which parameter is, and it's always renormalizable with period two, two, two. And what happens is that before this guy, all your maps 
have zero topological entropy, and after these parameters, all your maps have positive topological entropy. Okay? So the first infinitely normalizable parameter that you have uh, corresponds or belongs to the boundary between zero and positive topological entropy. And what happens is the following. Uh, if you want to understand how you reach this boundary parameter, there is this famous uh, mechanism called the period doubling bifurcation that I hope you all know. So you have parameters here, lambda n, uh, where you have this period doubling bifurcation, right? You have an attractor of period two to the power n, and this attractor at some point, it is persistent uh, for some, uh, on some interval as, as uh, Joanna was explaining before, but then at some point it loses hyperbolicity. And what happened, this guy be, became, becomes a, a repelling periodic orbit, but then a new periodic orbit uh, with the double of period appear and uh, appears and, uh, and belong attracting. So you, you are always attracted to a periodic orbit here of period two to the power n. And then in the limit, you have this guy. And then here is where the chaotic dynamics belong. So here, as I was saying, you always have zero topological entropy to the right. You always have positive entropy. And you will see here uh, uh, main, very complicated behavior intertwined. Uh, and, and I will try to explain a little bit this. So to understand this, I'm, I'm presenting this as an application of renormalization theory because you have the topological picture and to understand a lot of uh, specific phenomena, renormalization theory is quite important. So let me say the first one is what I was saying, the boundary of chaos. So the boundary of chaos is an expression uh, that means precisely the boundary between zero and positive topological entropy. So the idea when you study boundary of chaos is that you start with a dynamical system such that close to it, you always have zero topological entropy. And then you, you flow, you travel with a one parameter family and you ended up, you ended up with a, a dynamical system such that close to it, everybody has positive topological entropy, right? So you go from zero to positive topological entropy and the question, this is a general question, is uh, what are, which are the mechanisms uh, that uh, create the topological entropy? How is that you ended up in this work of positive topological entropy? So there is a parameter here. The idea is to try to understand what happens in the middle, the boundary, say, of the positive topological entropy, right? This is a difficult question. Uh, that makes sense in any dimension and in dynamics, you know, general dynamics with in compact metric spaces. I mean, you don't need to be on smooth manifolds or nothing. This is difficult to understand. And, uh, but in one dimensional dynamics, for instance, in interval dynamics and also in circle dynamics to understand this, uh, to understand what's going on. And this is part of what I was explaining before. Renormalization theory is, is probably the major tool that, that we have available, right? So in, in, for unimodal maps, the mechanism is what I was saying. You will always have a cascade of period doubling bifurcations accumulating on an infinitely renormalizable parameter. So the boundary of topological, ent of positive, sorry, topological entropy is always uh, made up by infinitely renormalizable. So this is one of the nice applications of this theory. There is another, uh, which uh, is related to you know, the statistical description of orbits and of dynamics. And it is important for this part of the dynamics that I was mentioning before, the, the chaotic part. So let me state a theorem uh, quickly, which say that in the quadratic family, for instance, for almost every parameter, there exists a physical mesh. So the theorem say that for almost every parameter, in, in, in my parametrization, that would mean for almost every lambda in zero form, you have a physical measure. So let me remind you quickly what it is a physical measure. So Joanna was explaining already the notion of ergodicity and so on. So physical measure means that if you take this set, this set, you can call it the basin of attraction of your measure mu. You have an invariant measure mu and you consider all points in your phase space M here for us is uh, the unit interval, right? So M is just the unit interval, but whatever. Uh, such that the average of any observable, so here for any C0, for any continuous observable, continuous real function, 
the average along the orbit of x in the limit coincide with the space average, as Shoana was explaining. So this limit, you are taking the average along the specific orbit of x coincides with the average in terms of the measure that you're looking for. Physical means that this basin of attraction has positive Lebesgue measure, okay? So, well, this is an, an, an important problem in smooth dynamical system is related Rio de Janeiro, due to the importance of IMPA, uh, everybody talk about Pali's conjecture, which I guess uh, most of you are well aware. So this is related to that. The idea is uh, how you prove existence of this measure, even finiteness of these measures. And moreover, if you have finitely many physical measures that the basins of attraction of these measures, they cover the whole phase space up to zero Lebesgue measure. So, the union of their basins of attraction has full Lebesgue measure. So this is a difficult uh, problem, uh, wide open in general. Uh, if you go, you know, outside the, uh, for instance, uh, hyperbolic dynamics, if you go beyond uniform hyperbolicity, but for this uh, quadratic family, and actually for any generic family of unimodal maps, uh, Making this topological behavior that I was uh, that that I draw there, this is this has been proved, and you may wonder, well, okay, very nice here, but so let this is uh, I have to mention Misha Lubitsch, and for generic family, this is due to Avila Lubitsch and Wellington de Mel and so on. This is already kind of classical, but you may wonder uh, what this has to do with renormalization, and the fact is that to prove this theorem, uh, you need to use. Uh, deep results, uh, deep understanding of the renormalization operator that I was describing before. So even that you don't need to mention renormalization at all to state the theorem, even for the quadratic family, uh, we don't know yet how to prove uh, such theorem uh, without renormalization theory, say only using classical tools from ergodic theory or whatever. Uh, well, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one knows how to do that. So this is, kind of a very nice and very powerful application of uh, renormalization theory to smooth ergodic theory and all this Paris program that I was mentioning before. And, uh, okay. And then another application, I'm, I'm being kind of uh, quickly because I have a brief time, but we can talk about whatever you want later. Yeah, so, you, uh, sorry, you have like about two minutes or so. Two minutes? Of... Okay, yeah, well, two minutes. Okay, good. So let me, the, the main application actually and, and the origin of this theory is uh, what is called universality and rigidity. So I was talking about how the cascade of period Dublin bifurcations converge to the infinitely normalizable parameter. And this convergence uh, actually happens at an exponential rate, as is written here. And the fact is that people were studying, this is in the late 70s, but it was studied by physicists, that for uh, many different families, uh, any family that, there, you know, any family with this topological picture that I was describing, the rate of conversion, this exponential rate of conversion was uh, universal, was always the same. So if you write the rate of conversion as, as one over delta to the power n, then this delta bigger than one was a, uh, the word that they used was universal. It was independent of the family. Any family, of course, is clear. I mean, it's not so difficult to prove that any family has the same topological picture, but the rate of conversion was the same. And this was kind of quite surprising. And the conjecture appeared, and actually this is the, the first appearance of renormalization theory in one dimensional dynamics, and it's due to Feigenbaum and Coulet and Tresser there was a conjecture about hyperbolicity of a fixed point. So the idea was that there exists fixed point and more generally uh, periodic orbits for the normalization operator that I was defining before. And they have this uh, local picture, this hyperbolic picture where you have stable manifolds of co dimension one and one unstable manifold. And I'm, well, if I don't have so much time to explain why this conjecture explained the universality, but the idea is that this delta that these people were discovering is just the unstable eigenvalue of this fixed point. 
And, uh, and the idea is that any family that you take after renormalization will be very close to this unstable manifold. So the behavior that you will see uh, will be comparable to the behavior that you see on the unstable manifold. And then this number appear naturally as a universal rate of conversion for this topological picture. So again, renormalization, uh, explaining such an important phenomenon that appear in physics, Another uh, important application, uh, maybe the last thing that I will describe, uh, was about rigidity. So what it means rigidity, so you can prove theorems like the following in many settings of uh, renormalization theory. If you have topologically conjugate maps, this notation means that C0 equivalent is just that they are topologically conjugate. And you can prove that the renormalization's orbit converge together exponentially fast then actually your original dynamics are C1 smoothly conjugate. So this, this is called rigidity. So the topological behavior of, the, of your dynamical system determines the geometric behavior. So being C0 conjugate and having uh, the renormalization orbit converging at an exponential rate implies that actually you have a smooth conjugacy, a diffeomorphism conjugating your original dynamics. So this is a loose statement. I'm not stating nothing precise here, but this holds in many, many situations, at least in one dimensional real and complex dynamics. And this is another application of renormalization theory to understand uh, these rigidity problems and more generally how C1 uh, smooth classes uh, distribute inside C0 classes. So usually you expect inside a topological class, the C1 classes to be very small, uh, but in this context, renormalization uh, helps you to prove that in some specific contents, this is not the case. The C1 classes are exactly the same than the C0 class. So, well, I think I will stop here, David. I, I don't have much more time, right? Uh, yes, we need to move on. Yeah, thank you for the... Okay, yeah, sorry for the brief exposition, but just... Just an overview of this uh, very nice theory. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll finish for the first whether I like it or not. So, um, so next we have the, our main speaker, Stanislav Enkel, is going to talk about Okay, so can you see? My presentation? Yes, I can see. Perfect. So, first of all, I would like to thank Davide for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, at the conference, at least remotely. So, as you can see, I am going to talk about some joint results with Aldo Pratelli, mostly. Okay, so let me first ask the question that we are interested in. We are interested in the so called famous Ball Evans approximation problem. So we have a domain in Rn, and we have a mapping from Rn into Rn, which lies in the first order solar space W1p. So function is integrable, and its derivative is integrable with our p. And we a priori know that the mapping is continuous, its inverse exists, and it's continuous as well. So we have a homomorphism. And we are asking if it is possible to find piecewise affine homomorphisms or uh, even diffeomorphisms, such that fk approximate f in the norm of the Sobolev space. So first thing you need to realize, this is not an easy question. So here is a simple picture from the plane to the plane. So I have four points, a, b, c, d, and I map them into these points, a, b, c, d, and I would like to approximate by, let's say, these slice linear mapping. So what I'm going to do on the triangle a, b, c, you are going to do this linear mapping, the red one, right? That's a natural thing. What you are going to do on the upper triangle? So we are the first automatic thing you will try to do is this triangle. But immediately in the intersection of the two red triangles, you have some place where your mapping is not one to one. So if you know the usual approximation techniques like mollification, truncation using maximum operator, whatever, all of these things will have problems. So even for Lipschitz mappings from the plane to the plane, you are in deep trouble and let's say on all scales. So somehow approximating a homomorphism is not easy. Next thing, 
So formally, my ball events approximation problem, I have two questions. If it's possible to approximate by slicefying homomorphisms, or if it's possible to approximate by diffeomorphisms. It's not difficult to see that if you can approximate by smooth maps, then you can approximate by piece like linear maps. But the opposite implication is also true, but already this requires some proof. So, okay, these problems are equivalent. So, if I can approximate by piece like linear, I can approximate by diffeomorphisms. So, why we are interested in problems like that? So, whenever you see some overview papers of John Paul, when he's talking about models of nonlinear elasticity. So, of course, if you want to have a model of nonlinear elasticity, you have finite energy. So, some integral of derivative to power p is definitely finite. You want your mapping to be continuous, so the material doesn't break into pieces. And because of the interpenetration of the matter, you want the mapping to be one to one. So, therefore, you talk about Sobolev homomorphisms. So, whenever you see those, Overview papers of John Balls, then one of the important questions he's asking there, can you prove the regularity of the model? Uh, when I have some integral of the energy functional and the energy functional goes to infinity whenever Jacobian is approaching zero. So this is definitely not easy. What you usually do in the proof of regularity that you would like to test the equation or variation of formulation with the solution itself. But a priori, the integrals you get in this way are not finite. Therefore, you would like to have something smooth close to the solution. So is there something smooth close to your solution? And this is not so easy. So we would like to know as a first step towards proving regularity, you would like to show that given Sobolev homomorphism, you can approximate it by, let's say, diffeomorphism in the Sobolev norm. And then you can try the whole business about regularity. Of course, if you know something about finite elements method, imagine that you have some reasonable mapping, you would like to do finite element method approximation, and if your mapping is a priori one-to-one, -one, you would like to have the approximation, which is also one-to-one. -one. Is it even possible? It's not clear. And of course, whenever you talk about so -called mapping, so the usual proof is, okay, imagine your mapping is smooth, then everything is easy. Uh, and in general case, you just approximate and pass to the limit. So this is a very strong approach, but if you somehow work in the place like nonlinear elasticity, when your mapping is one-to-one, -one, this is no longer possible if you don't know that you can approximate by one-to-one -one smooth mappings. So this is why we are interested in this problem. So uh, it was uh, open for a long time. The first result in this direction is due to Carlos Mora Corral. Uh, it was again planar, everything is planar on this slide. So if you have a mapping which is smooth up to one point, then you can approximate it around this one point. And even this was not easy. And then there was a great breakthrough result by Tadeu Shivanyets, Leonid Kolale, and Yannick Oninen. So in the planar case, if P is strictly bigger than one and smaller than infinity, if you have a homomorphism in the Sobolev space, then you can find diffeomorphism that converge in the Sobolev norm also uniformly and it has the correct boundary data, okay? Uh, so this left open the case P equals one, which was later solved in a joint paper with Aldo, and this will be the main result I will talk about today. So again, we have a homomorphism in W11. It's possible to find diffeomorphism that converge in the Sobolev norm, in W11 norm, uh, uniformly, and also it has the same boundary data. So now it's good that we have sort of two possibilities how to use a, a proof approximations. And later the technique from the other paper was applied, for example, to prove also approximation in DV or approximation of Bissobolev mappings where both F and inverse are in W11. You can approximate simultaneously FK converge to F and FK inverse converge to F inverse. And you can generalize it to other function spaces. So actually, not only Sobolev or Lick space, but you can assume that the derivative is in any function space, non function space with reasonable properties. Perfect. So this is the result that I will try to talk about in a minute. But before going into that, I would like to have a small peek into higher dimension. So let me tell you some. <laughs> Uh, problem which is not connected in the first glance. So this is a question by Piotr Heilage. 
if you can find the subtle homomorphism where the Jacobian is changing sign. So if you have a diffeomorphism, then always you know that the Jacobian is either non-negative almost everywhere or non-positive almost everywhere. But if you have only subtle homomorphism, is it possible that the Jacobian is changing sign? And indeed, it is possible. First, we have shown that it is indeed true for W11. So it is possible to find homomorphism from the unit cube to unit cube identity on the boundary. So not surprisingly, Jacobian is positive somewhere, but also the Jacobian is negative on a set of positive measure. Why are we interested in that? I mean, if you know something about change of variable formula, integral of the absolute value of the Jacobian equals to the measure of the image, it would be nice not to have the absolute value there, but you have to, because the Jacobian can be negative even for homomorphisms. Also, if you talk about models of nonlinear elasticity, people always assume that the Jacobian doesn't change sign. And what we would like to say that, at least for homomorphism, as soon as you know that your mapping is a homomorphism, this is something you can tell without loss of generality. And in a minute, we will see that it has some nice application and approximations. Later, we generalize it for other values of P. So for any P smaller than integer part of n half, so in dimension four, for any P between one and two, it is possible to find a homomorphism in the subtle space, so that the Jacobian is changing sign. And as a corollary, this one particle homomorphism, but the Jacobian is changing sign, cannot be approximated by diffeomorphism or by piecewise defining homomorphisms. And let me show you why it cannot be approximated. So it's not that difficult. This is really four lines proof. So we have a homomorphism where the Jacobian is changing sign. Assume that you can approximate it by smooth, let's say, diffeomorphism in the middle. Okay, so you know that the derivative of fk is converging to derivative of f in Lp. So up to a subsequence, you can assume that the derivative is converging to derivative for almost every point. Okay, that's something we teach to our students in measurement integration course. So if you know that the derivative is going to derivative, then definitely Jacobian is going to be Jacobian almost everywhere. This is just a polynomial of the derivative or whatever. So we know that the Jacobian is converging to the Jacobian almost everywhere, but our fk are smooth. So the Jacobian of fk doesn't change sign. It's either non-negative almost everywhere or non-positive almost everywhere. So without loss of generality, we can assume that the Jacobian of all fk is non-negative almost everywhere. It converges to the Jacobian almost everywhere. So the limit of the Jacobian, the limit function must also satisfy that the Jacobian is non-negative almost everywhere. But the Jacobian is changing sign, so we have a good prediction, and really this cannot be approximated. Okay. Next thing, there is a stupid condition p less than n half. Unfortunately, that one is needed because by some old result joined with Jan Mali, if you are in dimension two or three or in higher dimension and p is strictly bigger than n half, then the Jacobian cannot change. Sign. What is happening in the critical case? We don't know. Perfect. So that was just something that essentially everything, well, everything reasonable is known in the planar case. And in higher case, there are some obstacles. And there are some, even some homomorphisms that cannot be approximated. So now I would like to return to the planar result, which should be the main result of this talk. And I would like to give you some flavor of the proof. So let me recall the statement. We are in dimension two, we have a homomorphism from a planar domain into Rn, and we would like to find a diffeomorphism that converges to F uh, in the subtle F norm uniformly F correct boundary data. What is really key are the following extension theorems. So we have a unit cube, Q0, and we have a mapping from the boundary of the unit cube to R2, which is piecewise linear and one to one. So essentially, I have a cube, right? And I map it to something piecewise linear. And I know that restriction to the boundary is one to one. And then I can extend it inside a some piecewise linear mapping. And what is important that I control the energy of the extension by the energy of the boundary data. And of course, this is for the unit cube. If you don't have a unit cube, then you need to have a 
diameter of the cube somewhere here by simple translation. Perfect. So if you have a piecewise linear from the unit cube to the whole thing, you can extend inside and you control the energy of the extension by the energy of the boundary data. And then we need yet another extension theorem, which is somehow for single matrices. So again, you go from unit cube, you have a piecewise linear one-to-one -one mapping, which is really close to some singular mapping with zero Jacobian. Then there is some piecewise defined homomorphism extending it. And again, it is close to the singular matrix everywhere. Okay. I don't want to go into the details of extension theorem. So assume that I have these two extension theorems and I would like to tell you how the real proof goes. So, perfect. So first I find some Whitney type approximation on my domain. So I hope it's possible to switch. Well, let's say stop sharing. Perfect. Now do you see my usual screen? Or no? We see all of you. Okay, I will, I will try to... Sorry, that was not a good idea. Perfect. So uh, what we are going now is go back to this approximation and I will just try to draw some simple pictures. So I have my domain omega, I divide it into plenty of cubes. And of course I go finer and finer as a protein boundary. So I have some Whitney decomposition of my domain and I should use only a black mark next time. Perfect. So what I do now, I divide these cubes into good and bad. So my square is called good if my mapping is differentiable at its center, which means that the mapping is really close to a linear mapping on this cube. And at the same time, I have a Lebesgue point of the derivative. So the integral average of df minus the derivative at the center is really small. So again, we know that almost all points are points of differentiability, almost all points are Lebesgue points. So we know that almost all cubes are really nice in a sense that the image of this cube is really close to something like this. Okay? And if you have something like this, it will be sort of easy to approximate. What you do is you just really approximate by two slides in your map. So if you have a good cube, you can do simple approximation. And of course, most of the cubes are good, but some of the cubes are bad. And it will be the trouble for us. So now what we do, we would like to know that the integral over the boundary is in a certain sense, smaller than the integral over the whole cube. So of course, what we are doing now is you are somehow slightly enlarging and decreasing the size of the cube. And somewhere the integral over the boundary is smaller than the average. And if you think about it, what this really means, you will get this inequality at the end. So this is the adjust so that. Nothing else means that if this is not true, then somehow choose a slightly smaller cube or slightly bigger cube where the integral over the boundary is the smallest sort of, and you will get this. So the point is essentially the following. So I have some cube, maybe the integral with the boundary is big. So I will integrate like here using Fubine and then one of these, the integral will be small. This is what I do in step two. What I do in step three, that I am approximating by piecewise linear thing on the grid, which means that I have a cube and I have some reasonable continuous image, okay? My extension theorems work only for mappings that are piecewise linear, but my mapping at the moment doesn't need to be piecewise linear here. So I approximate it by piecewise linear things here, and I make a really small error that the lengths are almost the same. So, and in the further question, I will 
work with this piecewise defined approximation. Perfect. So what we do now that on bad cubes we use extension theorem one. So now we already have piecewise linear mapping on the boundary, and we extend it as a piecewise linear inside. And the integral of the derivative inside is controlled by the boundary datum. If we are on a good cubes where the derivative vanishes, we use the same extension procedure. If we are on a good cubes where the Jacobian vanishes, but the norm of the derivative is positive, that was the 1, 0, 0, 1 case, then we use extension theorem 2. And on good natural, on good squares where the derivative is bigger than 0 and the Jacobian is non negative, we use the natural approximation. So here is the picture of a natural approximation. If I have a good cube, so here is a picture of two good cubes where mapping is differentiable at the center, so it's really close to the linear one, see the dotted image. And uh, the integral of, I mean, I have a little point of the derivative. Uh, then really the image is something like this because the Jacobian is positive. And then I can simply divide it into two triangles. And on those two triangles, I use the simple linear approximation. And it works really well. Because my mapping is differentiable, the derivative on this triangle is essentially the same as the derivative on the original square. So I'm really close also in the satellite map. This is not the difficult case. The difficult case is the bad squares. There are only a small amount of them, but they are problematic. Okay, so what we do now, we need to show that really our mapping is close on all squares. So first, let us consider the bad square. So the image is really something horrible, like something that you see on the picture over there. So I want to approximate my mapping by the extension. So on each of the bad squares, I have a p-size linear mapping on the boundary. I have found a p-size linear extension inside. And I would like to see how close this is. So I use triangle inequality. So I have the integral over the derivative and the integral over the extension. And my extension works that the integral over the cube of the extension is smaller than the boundary datum. So this is exactly what is happening here. And the diameter of the cube, that was the scaling that was not included in the origin extension theorem. So what do you do now? So if you want to go to the next line, so this is already controlled by this term. And to control this boundary term, you need this, use this two point adjust the diameter of the cube times the boundary datum, the integral of the cube of the boundary is controlled by this expression. This is exactly what is happening here that the boundary behavior is controlled what is happening on slightly enlarged cube. And of course, since uh, derivative is integrable and most of the cubes are good, most of the points are points of differentiability, Lebesgue like points, then this can be made as small as possible because the measure of the good cubes or the enlarged is as small as possible. So you can make this really small by the absolute continuity of the integral of absolute value of dm. So this is how the approximation works on bad squares. So how it works on zero squares. So zero square, let me recall, is where the derivative vanishes. We use essentially the same argument. Triangle inequality, we have extension one. So again, this term appears here. Diameter of the cube times the integral of the boundary of the derivative. And now uh, we are approximating by integral again by enlarged cube by absolute value of df. And here I have added this because it is zero. So in the zero case, the norm of the derivative at the center is zero. So I have just subtracted zero. That's the only difference that I did from the previous case. And now by the definition of the Lebesgue point, this is really small. So in this way, I can control this expression. So if I go to the next case, which is a good square. So this is, uh, I have the function and I have the piecewise linear approximation. Let me go a few slides back. So this is a good case. A is this piecewise linear thing on the two squares. And it's not difficult to see that the piecewise linear thing on the good square is really close to the original matrix, so-called. So you just using the fact that the day derivative of the piecewise linear thing on the good squares is really close to the derivative of the center, you obtain some inequality of this, this side and using the fact that you are at the level point, you can finish. 
sort of easily. So the next thing, the last thing is what you do on the null square. So the Jacobinus vanishes, but the norm of the derivative is not. Then again, you divide, you subtract and add the derivative at the center. So the integral of the derivative minus the derivative of f of the center is controlled because you are at the Lebesgue point and you are left with this integral, derivative of g minus derivative at the center. And this is what the second extension theorem tells you. You are fine. So in this way, you obtain a piecewise a fine homomorphism, which is really close to your mapping. And by applying the result of Carlos Moracular and Ando Protelli, if you can approximate by piecewise fine, you can approximate by smooth. So really what you see that what is key here is the extension procedure. So if you have a square, you have some piecewise linear mapping, you need to extend inside by piecewise fine thing. So how much time do I have? Still enough? Uh, so the next session is in a bit over 20 minutes. So. so I can speak, let's say, for 10 minutes? Yes, yes, you can speak. Perfect. OK. So I would like to have some brief sketch how the extension theorem works. So we have a mapping from the unit cube to the unit cube. And we have a one-to-one -one mapping on the boundary. And we would like to extend it inside as a piecewise linear mapping. The boundary data is also piecewise linear. Perfect. So from some technical reason, I'm going to draw my unit squares rotated. We will see in a while why. So its image of the boundary is something like here, right? And here you can see I have a piecewise linear image. So there are some dots which corresponds uh, to point where I have two broken lines. So I see all the pre-images of dots. And now I draw a lot of vertical segments, okay? So I know that my mapping is defined on the boundary and I would like to extend it inside. First, I would like to see what are the images of those horizontal lines, okay? So for example, I have here this segment I, okay? Which starts here, ends here. I find the shortest path inside this, and this will be defined as my image, okay? I have the line in the middle, let's say from this point to this point. Again, I find the shortest path and I go. So you see some small problem because around this vertex, the mapping doesn't need to be one-to-one -one anymore. And I would like my extension to be one-to-one. -one. But somehow I have finitely many segments so there is something like the shortest segment. So I push it slightly apart, okay? To make it homomorphic. So if I have, you know, here one thing, here second thing, they are touching, I put it sli slightly apart so that I don't disturb any distances essentially. And now I have a homomorphism inside, perfect? Now I need to define my instance linear approximation. So I already have one thing, second thing. I know that the image is something piecewise linear here, something piecewise linear here. And I would like to extend it inside this parallelogram. Okay? So I hope that the green is visible, hopefully so. So what I do, I fill this with triangles. I fill this with triangles and I extend it. So, okay, so in this way, first I defined what are the images of horizontal segments, shortest paths. Then I fill with little triangles and I put little triangles here. And in this way, I have a piecewise defined homomorphism. And hopefully, if I'm lucky, the energy is sort of close. So, let me approximate the derivative of the extension. So my final goal is that the integral of the derivative of the extension is smaller than the integral of the derivative on the boundary. Okay? So I need to approximate two derivatives, the horizontal derivative and vertical derivative. If I can approximate these two, I'm fine. So first, let me approximate horizontal derivative. 
So imagine that I have a segment here and I have its image, right? So the integral of the derivative is nothing else than the length of this curve, this piecewise linear curve. And what is true that this length is smaller than the length of the boundary because this is the shortest curve inside. Okay, so let me draw a picture just here. So I have here my cube and I have here some horrible image. I have here my segment, I have here its image. And the length of the black line here is smaller than the length of the green one because this is the shortest curve. So the integral of the derivative in the horizontal direction is controlled by the boundary depth. Now you use Fubini and you have the control of this derivative, of this partial derivative. But you need to control this partial derivative as well, which is a bit more tricky. So imagine this segment J, okay? And I would like to estimate the integral of the derivative over this segment. So, Again, uh, the integral of the derivative is the length of this segment, nothing problematic. And I'm claiming that the length of this segment is smaller. So here I have segments J1, J2, image of J1, image of J2, and I claim that at least one of them is longer. And if at least one of them is longer, then I can integrate the derivative over j1, integral derivative over j2, and I have this control, which is again telling me that the derivative inside is smaller than the derivative on the boundary. And I will try to convince you that I'm not kidding. Okay? So I have here the picture, and I'm claiming that the picture looks something like this. That there is something like this, something like this, something like this. And therefore, the image of this black segment, which is something like this, is smaller than the minimum of these two. So imagine that I'm kidding. Imagine that this is really not the picture like this, but the picture is, let's say, something like this. Okay? Then I don't know how to control this distance by these two distances. But we have to imagine that this is the shortest curve inside. So if the picture looks like this, then it's possible to connect it like that. And therefore, this is really shorter than the one in this case. So you really can prove, using some geometrical interpretation, that really the image of this parallelogram must look something like this. So this length can be controlled by the maximum the length. And again, by using some sort of Fubini argument, this gives you the de desirable bound of the derivative of your extension using boundary data. Perfect. So this is essentially the proof of the extension theorem and the proof of the second extension theorem is sort of using similar ideas, slightly more delicate. Perfect. So these are the positive proofs I wanted to talk about, but it's good to end all talks by some open problems. So, now I said that essentially everything is known in the planar case. Well, it is true if you want to approximate only function itself. Imagine that you want to approximate both f and f inverse. So in the case p equals 1, if you want to approximate w, f in w11 and f inverse in w11, you can simultaneously by the result of Aldo. But imagine that you would like to do the most interesting case. You would like to approximate both f and f inverse in w12. So can you do it? No one knows how to do that. So the approximation techniques we have so far can approximate derivative, but not the derivative of the inverse simultaneously. Uh, that would be very nice. Or something like integral of derivative to power 2 plus 1 over Jacobian to power 2, which is natural for Neonukian type energy, in these terms are not possible to approximate at the moment. Next thing, uh, so I told you, yeah, we have plenty of positive results in dimension 2. We have some counterexamples in dimension 4 or higher. So what is happening in the most natural physical dimension in equals 3? And essentially, no one knows anything. 
So is it possible to somehow mimic the proof of uh, uh, Kovalev, Olinen, Ivanets? Can you show that some minimizers are dichromorphism? No one knows. Can you do some construction like here, but instead of using shortest curve using minimal surfaces or something? No one has a clue how to do that. Perfect. Uh, so I showed you that there are counterexamples in dimension four and higher if P is smaller than n half. But what is happening if P is bigger than n half? There still could be some other counterexamples using other ideas, not the sign of the Jacobian by something else. So one would expect that uh, the breakthrough point would be n minus one or n or something like that. And if your regularity is high enough, then you have a chance. But okay, so far only counterexamples are for p less than n half. And another question that is sort of interesting for me: we have some small result in this direction. So imagine that you have a second order support space. So if you talk about models of nonlinear elasticity, then sometimes you include second order derivatives because if you have a let's say two crystals, one in this direction, second in this direction, and if you want to change from this derivative to this derivative, you pay on the interspace of these two derivatives. There are some sort of interfacial energies. So sometimes people include even second derivative for these models. So can you approximate for these homomorphisms? Yes or no. So far, nothing reasonable exists in this direction. So I think that uh, this is a nice, point where I should stop my talk, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the talk. So it turns out we do have some time for questions. So I have a question here from uh, Lisa Santos. Uh, do you know if Lipschitz homeomorphisms are dense in W1P homeomorphisms for D bigger than 2? Does we know the so once again, if Lipschitz so uh, in W1P, because we know we showed for D bigger than four, we can't have the the other result. But I Lipschitz think that if you are in higher dimension, nothing is known at all. That nothing is known at all. For um, Lipschitz homomorphism, you don't know. Okay, thank you. So for uh, uh, and I have a question. So you did this all in uh, in R2. Would this be able to pass to two-dimensional manifolds with maybe some constant difference or something? Two-dimensional manifolds. I think that this is one of the questions I ask to my students. If you have a mapping from R2 into R3, you know, can you approximate? And mm -hmm. I believe that under some reasonable conditions, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I don't have questions more for you here, so thank you. But uh, since we do have time, I skipped over questions before because I think we didn't have time. So I know it's a bit unusual, So, but maybe we could go back and ask the question I had for uh, Alexandre Baraviere, if it's, uh, if it's okay. It's, it's hard to listen to you, but uh, well, uh, one of the questions uh, from Pedro Matias, uh, he's just asking if the technical conditions are necessary or just sufficient. Well, they are certainly necessary. Uh, we don't know if they are sufficient. We never, I think we never try to do the optimal conditions. So it's some, certainly it's something that we or someone can investigate. What are the, the, the necessary conditions in order to get this kind of result? So it's, it's certainly something that one can try to do. Uh, and there is another question by José Pedro Garaivão. Uh, José Pedro asked if the conditions in Bs and Cs are equivalent to say that the spectral return time to gamma zero to the level zero is finite. Uh, good question. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's correct, but I, I, I don't know if it makes the, the expected time to be finite. Seems reasonable, but I, I, the, the honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's my, my answer, my honest answer. 